And hello, folks. This is a video episode of Hour of the Wolf, unless you're, but don't look at your radio because that won't do a whole lot of good. But we are recording this at the same time. So uh, you can go to my channel on YouTube and watch what you just listened to, except that I suspect we will go longer than uh, the radio show allows, radio show being. 55 minutes less music and things like that. So um, we should get down to it. And with us today is a guest we haven't had in, oh, God, too long. When did you move out of uh, New York, Laura? I moved to Seattle about uh, eight years ago, I think. Yeah. So it's been a while. It's been a while. I was going to guess close to 10 years and i would have been more or less right i think so yeah yeah and has it been that long since i've actually seen you or have we uh, seen yeah. people at a convention no it's been that long it has been that long yeah because you're now we look way. good though you know <laughs> well yeah except that if i bend my head down there's a dome now showing through the ozone layer <laughs> over the top but i lied to my i lied to the radio listeners and tell them I still have a full head of auburn hair and that it's still frizzy. Uh, in fact, somebody just recently came up and posted on Facebook a photograph that cannot be later than about 1983. And, uh, and I almost started crying because there were so many, there are about eight people in the photo and of those eight, four are gone. Uh, yeah. So... It was delightful and depressing. As our, so many things are, yes. Yeah. Our guest is Laura Ann Gilman. How many times were you on Hour of the Wolf alone? Uh, Twice, I believe. And actually, here's a funny story. Um, when I when I first did your show at, you know, Oh God Early, mm. and I show up and you handed me this massive thing of coffee, which was the only reason I actually survived. Coffee should always you, be massive. Yeah. yeah, but you got a picture of me clutching it in front of in front of the mic. And we used that photo as the cover of my essay collection, I Have Strong Opinions. Oh, my. <laughs> so I guess I owe you a quarter for the photo. Uh, um, no, you owe me a copy of the photo. All right. If you have it digitized. I, I should, yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's it's it was a great photo. I look like I am not entirely sure I'm awake. Right. Uh, I am just, well, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, were any of us ever actually awake during At that hour? No, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's see. Now, uh, just making sure that we seem to have gone live on the various services. And, well, yeah, I think it has, but it's sort of hard to tell at a certain point from this vantage point, but that's okay. The the recording will be there whether people are watching live or not. Oh, oh, I see. Okay, we have six people watching live, so that's good. Hello, people. It, it does give me <laughs> numbers. Okay, and uh, oh, yes, let me uh, tell people who are on Facebook that... Facebook has all of a sudden discovered that some people enjoy privacy. And so they don't publish your name unless you give them permission. And in order to give them permission, you, you type in slash group dash comments at any time. It won't show up and you don't have to do it again. Just once and that will let us see you at all times so uh somebody said why okay <laughs> Th thank you so much well well because because we like you <laughs> we don't mind knowing who our audience is uh but uh, okay, and then the other part of that question is how many times you were on Hour of the Wolf. How many times did you do the New York Review of Science Fiction readings? Once. 
Only once? Only once. Yeah. Yep. Oh, look at that. So many people uh, are actually typing in group comments. That's great. That's very nice. Thank you, folks. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm looking at the bio they sent me, and I'm going to what it <laughs> looks like. It has to be the most important part. And what it says is Simon Schuster's a Viacom CBS company. Thank you. No, <laughs> that wasn't the question that I was asking. Um, but as long as we say Simon Schuster, we should say more to the point Saga Press. Yes. Uh, uh, who actually published Uncanny Times, which uh, is not only a spiffy book, but also the start of uh, the series that, uh, uh, do you have a number in mind? Well, the funny thing is it was never meant to be a series. Um, I had contracted with Saga Simon Schuster for two standalone novels, and this was the first one. And I sent it in and my editor read it and I get a call from him. And he said, I'm like, okay, did you like it? And he goes, yeah, can you write a sequel? And I went, um, yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly we're talking about it as a series and I'm yep. like, okay, this is good. I have the God knows the characters have more to say, but it was kind of a surprise to me that all of a sudden it's book one. <laughs> yeah. And in three years, you know, it'll start on Amazon and, uh, uh, Amazon uh, TV. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and go on and on. Um, Laura Ann Gilman is the author of the Locust bestsellers Silver on the Road and The Cold Eye, the award-winning Devil's West trilogy, the popular Costa Nostradamus books. I've always loved that name. And I, li I like those books, too. That's uh, the Retrievers and Paranormal Scene Investigations Urban Fantasy Series. And the Nebula-nominated The Vine Art War trilogy, my personal favorite, because... You get to have a glass of wine <laughs> while you're actually enjoying it. Uh, her most recent story collection is West Winds, Fools, and Other Stories of the Devil's West. And she continues to write and sell short fiction in a variety of genres. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, you're back to where you belong, which is sort of this mix of urban fantasy and romance and all the rest of it. It's a hybrid. I, I very definitely um, churn a whole bunch of genres together. Yeah. Uh, I get very bored trying to stick to a straight and narrow, if you will. Uh, for a while, Harlequin, when I was writing for them, wanted me to do paranormal romances and only, you know, just stay on the romance line. Mm. And that that didn't happen. I kept straying. I, I, you can show me where the lines are I'm supposed to color within, and I'll be like, yeah, that's very nice, and then I'll go completely outside. Uncanny Times is um, primarily historical fantasy, but it also is dark edged enough that a lot of people are considering it horror. And I'm not gonna say it's a romance, but there definitely are elements of that. And I borrow a lot from the romance genre. Yeah. Uh, when I'm telling the stories. Which is actually what I picked up on, I think, when yeah. I said that. Yeah, I, I, um, it, it just felt that way. And um, I've read a few people who, uh, one second, I have to. I'm engineering at the same time, people. <laughs> I've lost all of my engineering skills of late. Okay, there we go. Uh, people apologizing for being late. Why are they putting? They put something on my screen that prevents me from seeing most of the comments. But okay, we we see. We see a few of them. Um, anything in particular lead you toward uh, the Huntsman? And and I suppose we should ask what who they are. Who they are? Um, or should we do that after? This is reading? well. This is this is actually a good story in that um, I wrote this book honestly as an end result of fifteen years yelling at the TV screen watching Supernatural. 
saying, that's terrible world building. Oh my God, did you forget what you did three seasons ago? Why are you doing this? I mean, I love the show, I'm a major fan, but at the same time, I was just like, no, that's wrong, that's wrong. Oh my God, no, what, what are you doing? And then I said to myself, okay, so if you were telling this kind of story, how would you do it? And my first thought was, I wouldn't want to do it in a modern setting. Mm or at least not this modern setting, because I chose to set it in 1913 because of so many echoes in that period and our time, but also because that was when you really saw a shift in a lot of people's perceptions between science and, and superstition. And it really, in a lot of ways, was the beginning of a, a modern age, not the modern age. Mm -hmm. So that's what, uh, drew me to write in that particular kind of story in that particular time zone, uh, time frame. Okay, yeah, and uh, <clears throat> pardon, it works very well. It establishes its era very quickly and very nicely, um, and it, and it's got some fun characters. Of course, I mean, you know, I love the dog. <laughs> Everybody loves the dog. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, um, botheration. And I have to say that everybody's complimenting me on the name botheration. Yeah. I totally, I totally stole it from somebody, I believe on Tumblr and I told them I was doing it and they were cool with it. I don't even remember how it came about, but I was like, Oh my God, that's a great name. I am taking it. Yeah. Okay. And good. that just was kind of, I didn't know who the character was going to be, but I knew that there had to be a character named Bother. Steal, steal it all the way and trademark it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you yeah, know, absolutely. It's, you know, before the T-shirts start coming out and all that and you don't get a piece of it. So. Well, I mean, that, that's what that's what re writers do is, you know, we go through life plucking things as we see them and as we hear them and we throw them into the store brain and wait and eventually we'll need them. Yeah, and, and you use the, uh, uh, the old uh, uh, quote attributed to Picasso which is good artists uh, borrow, great artists steal. So, so it, it goes along with that. Um, would, would you like to give us a taste? Sure, I can give a quick taste. Um, it's tough with this book because everything builds. Okay. Um, so I have to be very careful. I had to be very careful That's finding right. something that wouldn't be a spoiler. Yeah, the, the, the revelations... Uh, one should say it's a slow burn. Is that, is that fair? That That is definitely fair. So the scene I'm, I'm going to read from a quick little bit is um, Rosemary and Aaron Harker have been sent to the town of Brunson, upstate New York, um, because their distant cousin has been, uh, has been murdered, has been killed, and his last act was to leave a note for his widow saying, um, if I if I am found dead, call the Huntsman. Um, the Huntsman being a group that hunts down the uncanny, um, the supernatural, when they become a threat, and specifically to call the Harkers. So this scene is um, they're they're speaking for the first time with the widow. Do you know why he left the note? The old man hadn't been huntsman himself, but he would have been trained in caution. How much had he told his wife? The widow shook her head. No, Tucker didn't like to bother me with his worries. I assume it was something to do with the matters your father used to look into. He would never tell me about that either. Only that it was important and secret, and I should never speak of it to anyone without his say-so. I used to tease him, say he must be a government agent or... Well, it was the foolishness married couples say to each other, but I trusted him and he trusted me. The woman looked at them, her soft eyes worried. Did that, did what he did with your father have something to do with his death? Was he working on something for your father? Can you tell me why my husband died? They could, but they shouldn't. Your letter was the first we'd heard from him in years, Aaron said as gently as he knew how. Our father is no longer with us but we will learn what we can. And they would tell her what they could. 
Is there anything you can tell us about the days before his death? Anything that seems strange, out of character, or simply odd? There was fire still left in the widow, the way her eyes narrowed, not so much in anger as frustration. I wish there was something I could tell you. Back in the days when he and your father corresponded, he would tell me if there was something I needed to keep my eyes open for. Strangers hanging about, that sort of thing, although he never told me why. But the past few years, there's been none of that. It's been quiet, peaceful. He'd retired a few years ago, closed his practice. People go to Dr. Miller now. She frowned, her wrinkled mouth thinning and turning down at the edges. But the past few weeks, no, a month now, he'd seemed troubled. He started keeping a journal again, and I would come down in the morning and find him at the table with it open in front of him, a cup of tea already cooled. But he would laugh it off when I asked him about it, tell me that it was nothing I need worry about. So I didn't. Aaron leaned forward, elbows on his knees. Do you still have that journal? Mrs. Lovelace shook her head, a silver curl, single silver curl coming loose from under the tortoiseshell comb to dangle along her jaw. The police asked the same thing and I gave it to them. Although I don't know what use they'll have of it unless they read Latin. Tucker used to laugh, said he started doing it in school to make sure he kept his skill with the language and then just kept doing it. Aaron looked at Rosemary and gave just a hint of a nod. Unless the local constabulary, unlike the local constabulary, he had enough skill with the language to translate the journal once they had it in their possession. The trick would be getting it from the police. But that last night, he never came to bed. The widow blushed slightly, looking down at her hands as though betraying something deeply personal. I never heard him leave the house, but when I was woke up, he was gone. And then the officer came and he never walked outside at night. His eyesight was beginning to fail and darkness made it worse. He couldn't even read without her voice cut off. But he must have gone outside, mustn't he? Because that's where he, she took a deep breath. That's where he died, was killed. Now she did break, although only a few tears escaped. Something killed him on the streets of our town. Nobody heard or saw a thing. Aaron looked at Rosemary, feeling the first stirrings of panic at the old woman's tears. She rolled her eyes at him, then reached over and took one of the old woman's hands between her own. Ma'am, Mrs. Lovelace, Margaret, please. Rosemary nodded. Margaret, you said it happened on the street. Near here? Do you know which one? I, of course, you want to. And she swallowed, then sat up straighter. You will want to see where it happened. He had a route he walked during the day. He must have followed it. They found him, they found him on Culpepper, by the Broughton's house, oh, which would mean nothing to you, my apologies. The White House with the dark green trim. Her face crumpled. They, when they took, they said it was likely a cougar gone hungry in the winter that he must have gone under a branch and it was a closed casket. I never had a chance to say goodbye. Aaron was afraid they'd be treated to hysteria, but while the look she turned on them was both then was filled with grief, it was no soft weeping thing, but rather a fierce, hard determination. They told me it was a cougar, but they took his journal. They wouldn't have done that if it had been an animal attack, would they? It may be that they are simply being thorough, Rosemary said. Aaron didn't believe that and neither did she, but neither of them knew what it did mean, yet. You'll find out, Mrs. Lovelace sounded certain. You'll tell me? She turned and spoke directly to Aaron now, as though she'd been waiting for a man to lay her problems in front of. You'll find out what killed him? It won't bring him back, it won't change anything, but I need to know. Aaron and Rosemary exchanged glances. If Lovelace had left a note for them to be called in, if it was related to whatever left him worried at night, there was no way they could tell her the truth. And even if they could, it certainly wouldn't bring her peace. Okay, well, it's going to... No, it brought me right in. Okay, sometimes it gives a countdown before it will allow me... Uh to appear now that's not right okay there we go uh so one person uh not long after you began said cool i love supernatural and i live in upstate new york so so you definitely hit a demographic uh 
on that one. And another note again for uh, people on Facebook, because a few people came in late. Oh, we actually seem to have a fairly nice audience. I'm so pleased. Um, we'd like you to just, in the comments area, <clears throat> just type in slash, uh, forward slash, group dash comments. And that way we can see your name. Otherwise, all that we see is the, the ominous Facebook user. And, uh, <laughs> you know, which I guess is going to become meta user or something like that. Oh, so, God. Yeah. Help us all, please, please. Different names, same nonsense. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and But some people are, nonetheless, we're getting a lot of, like, applause from various people. Just clap, clap, clap. But, yeah, I can... Um, uh, I can see that. Oh, and thank you, uh, Barbara Krasno. It's actually group bash comments. But, okay. Uh, so, so, but she must have done it right at some point, or I couldn't uh... tell that it was Barbara. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Here's. Oh, the oh, the joys of technology. Even after two plus years of pandemic, we still haven't quite figured it out. <laughs> yeah, and and uh, I I think that some of the companies like like this one that we're using have recognized that because yet another one launched only a month ago, and uh, this software, not to get into all mm -hmm. the software, yeah. but this isn't like Zoom where either you pay a rate and then have something that uh, for a conference room or lots of people asking yeah. questions this is presentation software yeah so from one to many yeah but it's been it's been fun I, one of the things I, I love about all of this is i have been able to reach out uh, we were talking earlier i'm going to be attending virtually attending uh, mm. octacon which is the irish national science fiction convention this weekend um they reached out to me they're like yes we talk to us about the book and, and do a reading and do this. And, and I'm like, and I can stay in my own time zone and do this. This is awesome. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. 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 Although, yeah. Hang green curtains behind you. Yeah. I had to figure out first the time difference between Seattle and Dublin, uh, which took me longer than it should have not, not to figure out what the time oh. difference was. I knew it was eight hours, but yeah. to actually figure out the math of what time my panels were. Oh, uh, yeah. That can be, which is we almost harder have than it should have been. New York, Seattle. Yeah, yeah. Um, the three-hour difference I've kind of internalized for the most part, but yeah, it is. Last weekend we did a panel um, at Virtual ICFA um, where uh, our moderator was coming in from Australia and one of our panelists was coming in from Singapore. So those of us who are on the West Coast were not complaining because it's Singapore. It was like four in the morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. These are the things we do for our audiences. <laughs> uh, no, we, yeah. Uh, yeah, we, 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 we did a uh, New York, Singapore event with uh, Jason Eric Lundberg. And uh, we were downing coffee to stay awake late and he was down in coffee to wake up to get up yeah yeah to get up and and that worked well same thing with jack dan yeah the the only times this virtual kind of thing doesn't work and it's happened for example we had james morrow who lives like out in the middle of the woods yeah if you don't have good signal it's it can be a problem yeah he and karen hewler are the only people but karen at least knows a park of all things, a lovely park where she can go and just sit in the middle of the park and she gets a great signal there and makes for a great backdrop as long as the weather is good. But it was, yeah, it was interesting though. When I was researching this book, um, I tried to get myself out of technological mode. Yeah. And so I challenged myself to go like four days without checking email or, you know, any of the, torture oh i was miserable i was miserable i did not realize how much i depend <laughs> on it. Just... yeah all of us i mean you know just just take away my phone i i i, I can't go from one floor to another and not have my phone uh, especially because sometimes the, it doesn't ring 
properly. And so what if somebody calls and I missed a call and stuff like that? So yeah, we, we, we it becomes obsessive uh, along with everything else. But, uh, uh, that, that, but that brings up a good question. Oh, I'm sorry. We just, uh, I just noticed that Barbara, in fact, posted, love the idea of visiting an Irish con virtually. Yeah, well, maybe we can do it. I was going to say, yep. Yeah, no reason why not. The thing is to get the single malts in time. <laughs> that's that's the important oh, yeah. part. I was going to say, you live in New York. I firmly believe there are alcohol delivery services. Yeah. Okay, so one person... Who said did it finally work meaning uh no the names the... are still not showing up no uh, well some are but some aren't but at any rate hmm. one person facebook user is asking what is your writing routine it's always, it's always uh, a popular question my writing routine is that i have absolutely no routine um in that i'm usually juggling um i have a a job a paycheck job and i am in the middle of training a dog uh, which is an ongoing process and dealing with a bunch of other projects um speaking of speaking of dog yeah the dog just decided to make her presence known um so <laughs> i've learned the hard way that i get my writing done wherever i can mm -hmm. and whenever i can uh, I wrote most of my first book on the back. I can say this now because it's been a long time and most of the people who were in those meetings have left the industry, but I wrote my first book mostly on the back of uh, meeting agenda notes when I was working in publishing. Mm -hmm. I'd be sitting there waiting for my turn to participate and would write scenes longhand and then go home and, and translate them. Wow. But mostly I, uh, I scribble a lot of notes and work out problems in my head and on paper. And then I just sit down and write. Uh, I joke that my outlines look like Google directions in that they're perfectly accurate until they're completely wrong. Mm -hmm. And my editors have learned that, um, yeah, I can, I can give them a breakdown of every chapter before I write it, and about 80% of that will be in the final book, and then there'll be 20% that just seemingly came out of nowhere. Uh, I'm neither a plant pantser nor a planner. Mm -hmm. um, I think they call them plantsers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I, I have an idea of where I'm going, and I know where I'm going to end up, but the journey itself is an adventure, which... I guess if I have any routine at all, it's that I'm telling the story to myself as much as I'm telling it to anybody else. Uh, I want to know how the story goes, so I have to write it. Fair enough. Now, uh, <clears throat> at what point do you do the world building in terms of the actual plot and characters? How do these different things come into place? A lot of it evolves as I'm writing. I'm not one of those people who, I know a lot of writers will do like character sheets or they'll do maps or anything like that. My process is a lot more organic in that I will start writing. Again, like I said, I know where I'm gonna end up and I kind of know how we're gonna get there. But I will start writing a scene and as I'm writing the scene, it will unroll for me and the characters develop for me. Uh, I, lear I learn them as I'm writing their dialogue. Well, okay, what, what comes naturally out of this scene? Uh, interestingly enough, I rarely have to rewrite dialogue. Scenes I will rewrite, actions I will rewrite, but the dialogue usually just shows up um, accurately, uh, at least after the first chapter. The first chapter is always a crap shoot. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's as I'm building, as I'm writing, the world comes into shape around me. And as it comes into shape for me, I give it to the reader. And sometimes I'll have to stop and go, okay, you know, um, all right, where are we? What's going on here? What is, what caused this to happen? And then I'll have to backtrack a little bit. But 
I like to joke that um, my brain is made up of two parts, lizard brain and the mammal brain. And the lizard brain is the one that basically has this all figured out ahead of time, goes ahead and throws, this, throws the, the seeds of the story. And then the mammal brain comes along and thinks it's doing all the work and creating everything, but it's really just picking up what the lizard brain has put down. And the two don't talk to each other. Uh-huh. So I'm, you know, as, as the mammal brain, the thinking brain, I'm like, wow, this is, oh, no, I already, I already thought of this. I mean, that's why it's there. That's why it's in my brain, because the lizard brain already went ahead and did the work. Uh, I always joke that radio, it's tough because you can't see how my hands are moving when I talk. That's like half the dialogue there. But it very much is a process of me discovering what I've already figured out. Mm -hmm. Which I'm sure my therapist would have a field day with. <laughs> <laughs> well, and your therapist can read your books and get a head start. Yeah, yeah that's terrifying. Thank you for that. Yeah, I, do, it, <laughs> yeah I would really think it is. But um, but I also noticed that you're an awfully prolific writer, or a wonderfully prolific writer. Uh, seems to be a better way to put that phrase. Um, yeah, I mean, you've been writing, I don't know what number of years, how many books do you have out or have you, um, I think upwards of 30, are yeah. we including the ones I write under pseudonym and are we including the yes. media tie-ins? Inclu include, including all. How okay. Many? Um, there are, ten, hold on, there are 10 books in the Costa Nostradamus. There are three books in the Vine Art War trilogy, three books in the Devil's West trilogy, so we're up to 16. Right. I wrote three paranormal romances, three paranormal romances, two, two, two or three. I wrote a couple of novellas, but we're talking about novels. Two para, para, paranormal novellas, so that's 18. The uh, Portals duology, so that's 20. There were four mysteries under the name L.A. Kornetsky, so that's 24. Um, I'm forgetting things. I know I'm forgetting things. It's short really story, embarrassing. All, short story collections. A couple of short story collections. Yeah, we've got Uncanny Times. Um, yeah. It's, so we've hit about then, 20, then, 324. And then there were uh, four media tie-ins. Okay. Um, there, there's, I'm, I'm forgetting something. I know I'm forgetting something. It's very embarrassing. You well, know you've been writing a while when you're just like, I don't remember. Let me go look at my bookshelf. I don't know. 30, I can't even 30, do that anymore. They're mostly in storage. 30 give or take. Yeah. Or you should say to the audience, 30 give or buy. Give or buy. Yes. That, that's the thing to do. And, uh, you, know, you know, because uh, uh, this is one of the very few times, you and I haven't spoken for a little while, and it's one of the very few times that we got together through a publicist. <laughs> yes. <laughs> who somehow didn't seem to realize that I would already know you. And I was so. Oh, it's 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 her it's her job to be very professional, and the two of us were just and being very was, goofy. Yeah. Was, <laughs> but there were like uh, when I finally actually wrote you, giving you instructions and how to log mm -hmm. in, at uh, I'd say about twenty twenty five emails had passed between me and Saga Press before <laughs> uh, uh, before we thought to include you. Usually, I see somebody in a hallway at a science fiction convention. And say, okay, so what date are we doing this for you? Okay, yeah. and a reading, and, his, <laughs> and it's like you know, my work here is done. And oh, hi, there's a publicist. How are you? See you later. You know, see, see you at this uh, single malt tasting because that's the best place to meet people are at the single it malt tastings. It it they really are. Are there any in the West Coast? Uh, none official. None official. There are many single malt drinkers. Yes, out here. I would hope. Um, and in fact, Especially next week Seattle. when Uncanny Times comes out, we are going to a local bar that specializes in uh, whiskeys, and we are going to raise a few for it. Oh, very. Because as one should, yeah. Yes, absolutely. The uh, a, a couple of uh, raising of whiskeys uh, with you in the room come to mind, but I can't repeat the stories. Because they were 
um, about people we were losing, and you raised the glass and said, F cancer. Yes, no, yes, sure you, which you is which F. is a feeling I I even more so feel now. But yeah. Yeah, yeah very much so. And uh, the pandemic hasn't, although I don't know anybody, we've actually, well, I know plenty of people who had COVID, but hmm. I don't know anybody who we've lost through that directly. There may have been, there have been other. I do. I do. Oh, yeah. Sorry Unfortunately. Yeah. 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 Well, well, you and I, for that matter, we both have a wide circle of people that we know. Um. Where whereabouts are you in Seattle? Are you in an urban zone in a shit in, in in a green place? Uh, I am. I am. It, well, it's Seattle is interesting in that, like New York City, it's actually a bunch of neighborhoods that just kind of got consumed by the city. And I live in one of the neighborhoods that was originally a town, mm. and as Seattle grew, it just kind of expanded over it. Uh, and it's very nice. It's really pretty. We have this beautiful park next door that um, if you go out at exactly the right hour of the wee morning, you will uh, encounter coyotes and owls. Um, so far, no mountain lions, but I know that they are local. There's a reason why we keep the cats inside. Yeah. Uh, but I am still part of the city. I'm literally um, 10 minutes from downtown. Oh, assuming no great. traffic. That's great. Good so job. it's, yeah, Seattle is a small city compared to New York um, and much less uh, densely populated. So to me, it still feels like I'm living just in a really big town. Mm -hmm. But I love it here. It's it's really beautiful. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I, I'm uh, where I am in Brooklyn. We have gotten a possum. And that's about <clears throat> and and that caused a stir. That, you know, uh, we have we have possums, we have foxes, we have raccoons the size of of they're huge. Uh, the first time I saw one, I was like, "Oh my god, what are they feeding you?" Um, yeah, it's not uh, not not, uh, not at home, but I got mauled by a raccoon once. Oof! Even a yeah, and we also apparently have uh, pine martens. Ooh. Which, yeah, I haven't seen them yet, but some of my neighbors have, which is kind of fun. Um, those of you who don't know, there there are a, a a weasel relative, and they are very fast and very cute and very vicious. Yeah. And we are hoping they will take care of the rat population once and for all. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Set one against the other, and uh, yeah. uh, hopefully you won't then have to choose what animal will have to get rid of the pine martens, that whole... Yeah, well, the, 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 the coyotes will take care of that if they hang around too long. Yeah. Um, yeah. What are you writing nowadays in terms of nonfiction? Not so much in terms of nonfiction. I'm still doing my, my rants for Patreon. Um, one of the things... I, I've been running the Patreon now for a number of years, and one of the things I do every month is a rant on something, uh, a non-political topic. Uh, basically, whatever has me muttering under my breath when I'm driving somewhere, something has gotten me so annoyed um, that I just have to say something or explode, and they are definitely not safe for work, for language. Mm -hmm. um, I, I channel my, 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 my Jersey-born self, mm -hmm. and all the words I'm not allowed to say on radio get said in these essays. But I try to also be entertaining with it. Uh, and that's kind of my outlet for nonfiction these days. Yeah, it's, now that I'm in a prime fun. time slot, I'm finally in a place. <laughs> I, yeah, I got into trouble. Yeah, I've been in what in radio, what they call safe harbor. So, you know, mm -hmm. kids won't be listening. And I could just go ahead and use any of those happy words. And um, I rebroadcast an old show. <clears throat> with, oops. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, with a major oops. And it was by Veronica Roth. And I and I think of uh, Veronica Roth. Okay, yeah, she writes for tweens, she, you know, and adolescents, but this was her first non this is her first adult novel. A very good one, by the way. <clears throat> Pardon me. And I had forgotten 
and just and th this was a Saturday morning at starting at seven a.m. going seven to nine a.m. and uh, yeah, two weeks suspension, but uh, well, yeah, they no, they needed to do it because yeah, if they didn't suspend me, then the appearance would be yeah, they're not howling. Yeah. Yeah, that they're not controlling the station. And yeah. We have Lang language is an interesting thing. I mean, you and I have had this discussion before. Yeah. But language is an interesting thing in that people are so afraid of it. Yeah. You know, the the words and, and what they mean or what they don't mean or what we think they mean, it's of all the things that you can be scared of with your your, your what your kids are doing, hearing a bad word seems very low on the list. Yes. Oh, yeah, it's, it's a podcast now. We have a cat. Hi, yes. Cass. Yes. And <laughs> yeah, but 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 that that cat can be a very content cat. And since it's also radio, uh, we might hear him. Her. Yes, he him. 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 Yeah, if he if he if he comes if he comes closer, we will hear his purr. He sounds like an outboard motor. Yeah, he really. Um, no, he he purrs loud enough to wake me up at nights. Yeah, it's a classic classic sound. I heard it before. We're actually getting a uh, few questions here. Oh oh yeah. Yeah okay. So uh, the first one. Sorry about your mariners. Oh my god. Oh. Does yeah. it really rain as much as they say? There in the Seattle, my brother lived in Seattle a while. His yeah. answer was about as much as New York. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you for your condolences. I am actually not a Mariners fan. I am daughter and granddaughter of Red Sox Nation. But I work, my job, uh, my day job is I am um, office manager for a physical therapy office. And we have some diehard Mariners fans there. And I suspect there's going to be some very unhappy people in the office tomorrow because, yeah, yeah this was not a good, this has not, not been a good series for us so far. Not a happy um, day. For yeah. Us, As to the answer to the rain, honestly, first of all, it hasn't rained. Our, our autumn rains have not come yet and we're starting to get a little panicked because it should be raining by now. Um, we need the rain we have uh forest fires wildfires that are burning um the smoke is coming into the city we need the rain to calm things down but coming out here for the first time i realized in new york we had rain i mean you got up in the morning and it was pouring and you went to work and you wore your raincoat and you came home and it was still pouring and you were soaked and you had to have your know, shoes were wet here it's overcast almost all winter. We do not see the sun very often once the rain starts, or what I call the inglumining. <laughs> but it doesn't pour like that as a rule. Um, we will have steady rain, but it'll be very light. Uh, it will be a steady drizzle. You just get used to it. You don't even, honestly, I don't even own a raincoat anymore. I haven't opened an umbrella in eight years. <laughs> I have a hoodie. I put the hood up and, you know, that's all we need. We have started getting more thunderstorms. When I first moved out here, everybody told me, no, there's no thunder. It doesn't, we don't get thunderstorms here. And now we do a little more often. So that's a little sound of home for me. But yeah. mostly it's just, it's, I joke that it's like living under, under hill. It's like living in the fairylands because everything is just this pearlescent overcast gray. That not, that must make for a good writing atmosphere. Uh, it makes me happy because I get uh, migraines from sun glare. So I joke that I moved out here for the lack of for the lack of sunlight. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We all go we all go insane in the summer when it's beautiful. We have like three months of perfect weather, and then it's gone. Yeah. Uh, well, the three months of really nice weather that we had, and I should say the six weeks of nice weather we had were at a high point of the pandemic. So <laughs> I wasn't going out anyway. Mm. Not even, uh, uh, although we finally did go birding in the, uh, we have a new park in Brooklyn. So yeah. Sure One of the things every, almost everybody does out here is hiking or biking. So we're outside a lot. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a good thing. And another question, citing uh, an acquaintance of yours. Did you ever get asked to write a supernatural tie-in? And then had to add to that, Keith DeCandido's are great. Yeah. And I'm wondering, Keith? I did, I did not, um, but also I never tried. Uh, generally, you have to pitch to, to be considered to do a media tie-in. Yeah. Um, and honestly, I really, at the time, I just didn't, I was enjoying the show, but I had like 9,000 other things on my plate and it just wasn't, it wasn't something, um, I pitch, I did pitch at the, not at the same time, but I was pitching for leverage and they rejected my idea basically saying, yeah, we already have this concept. We're already doing an episode. And I'm like, well, at least I was I was in on the right mentality of it. Uh, and then the episode aired and my friends and I were looking at it going, yeah, my idea was better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's a shame. Sometimes I feel that way with certain TV shows that I've yeah. watched a show and say, yeah, my idea was better. And, yeah. and that very often happens with my partner, Barbara Krasnoff, who's also a writer. And she'll say, well, they could have done blah, blah, blah. And I'll say, yeah, that would have been far superior. Yeah, actually, um, one of my Facebook memories came up was uh, several years ago, I'd had a dream of how Supernatural should end this, this and very detailed. And it was very much a, Ooh, just hurt me, why don't you? Um, and I looked at it now and I'm like, yeah, I thought then it probably would be a really good and it definitely was a better ending than the one they gave us. I am, by the way, for the Supernatural fans out there, I am team finale did not happen. <laughs> um, you know, the second to last episode, that was it. That's where, yeah. that's where we ended. I, I never got and it. It, it's, Sorry, go it, was, it was a fun show. It, it broke your heart. It made you crazy. Um, and yeah, opinions are very split about the finale. Yeah. Oh, one second. Uh, I think we're doing okay here, but I'm getting messages about linked accounts and stuff like that that I don't begin to understand and I'll deal with after we're done because it doesn't, hopefully won't interrupt our uh, uh, chat here. Uh, I understand there is to be perhaps a supernatural prequel. It actually premiered. Yeah. Oh, um, okay. yeah. Uh, yeah. I have not seen it yet because I am on deadline right. and uh, my TV has not been turned on in the past couple of weeks. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, in case my editor is watching. Yes, I'm working. Uh, <laughs> but yes, it did premiere. The friends I have who've watched it say it's um, it's good, which is better than they were expecting. But they they seem very enthusiastic about it. Okay, I'm I'm still bitter that. Hmm? Are there new showrunners? I, uh, I I believe there's some carryover. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm still annoyed that we didn't get a Wayward Sisters, so I'm going bitter to my grave about that. That was uh, one of the spinoff attempts they had that I was all in for, and it didn't happen. Well, maybe you should. I will die bitter. Yeah. I will die bitter about that. Pitch that to somebody and see how that <laughs> how that flies. Um, yeah, I somehow never got into Supernatural. Watched like the first two episodes, and it just didn't draw me in. And also it was problematic that Supernatural and Grimm came out about the same time. And I think Grimm sort of like took away some of the niftiness of Supernatural. They were very, very different shows. Um, and also Supernatural over 15 years. And this is interesting because yeah. I think this always happens. It happens to a series, a book series. It happens to TV. Um, different showrunners changed the feel of the show very much. And some people hated that. I thought it was fabulous because mm -hmm. that's how it managed to survive that long, which is something I always feel. You have to reinvent on a regular basis if you want something to continue. Yeah. Even if you're writing a book series with beloved characters, you have to do something different. You have to have a different angle to keep things going. Yeah. And, and, and I case, think that's one thing Supernatural did really well. Yeah. In the case of, of one of my favorite shows, they killed off the lead character. 
I won't mention which show because well, they did that in Supernatural all the time, but it never took. <laughs> yeah, yes. Well, of course, you can always bring them back to life. And I suspect in the show that I'm referring to, they could have if they wanted to, but they were serious. They really wanted to jar things up. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. the show, as a result, I think, went only one more season. Mm -hmm. And that was it for that series. Uh, now, somebody says Supernatural came out a few years before Grimm. I yeah, see that was my memory. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I stand corrected. I guess I only started getting around to them. I do so much just uh, since I can do virtual recording mm -hmm. nowadays. I'm just constantly clicking record, 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 record. It's all in the cloud. And I can go back and watch something almost any time. Uh, one person wanted to come <laughs> And said, "I love the final episode." And like that's... I said, the fan the fandom was split. The fandom was split. Okay. Um, okay. Just like the yeah. Sopranos and all that. Uh, that's how it goes. Yeah. There. There was. It's it's a contentious fandom. We all have very strong opinions. Yeah. So um, we're at the fifty one minute mark of what on radio will end up being forty five minutes, but of course online we'll we'll have the whole thing available but uh let's see what are the usual closing questions well we we can guess what you're working on now you're working on the second huntsman book i am working on that i'm also working on a project that is sort of near and dear to my heart um which is a series of paranormal romance novellas ah, uh, the romance. first the first Starwood. yep the first, the first one was called Something Perfect, and it came out a little bit ago. It was an indie public indie publishing job. Uh, the one I'm working on now is called Something Real, and they are paranormal romances, but with non-traditional uh, protagonists. In that the something uh, Something Perfect was about a triad, not a love triangle, but mm -hmm. a um, a committed threesome and this new one um, one character is not human and the other is human but ace and it is very much a romance and I really I'm doing a series or basically uh, characters who haven't people haven't been able to see themselves in traditional romances whether they were straight or queer getting a chance to to have that to have that romance to have that story around them yeah and uh it's it's a lot of fun i've been able to talk to a lot of people um for experiences not my own and get their feedback on what they want and how they would want to see characters developed um and I just, it's really, I understand it's, it's not a big New York project, but it is very much one that's close to my heart. And I've been enjoying doing it. And I, I, I know I'm going to have at least one more. I'm not sure after that. We'll see. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was going to ask if there was anything, you know, in the trunk or like that, that you'd be pulling out and uh, working on soon. But that's also, I mean, we've got two books right there. Yeah. So that's enough. So uh, where is your Patreon for the, uh, since we referred to it earlier? Uh, yeah, well, it's on Patreon, obviously. Uh, just under my name, uh, the base level is um, the rants and recipes and snippets from what I'm working on. And for those at a higher level, I'm working on a project that's uh, tentatively called Bina Road, which is a... Uh, historical fantasy again set around the gold rush mm -hmm. and it's uh basically a road trip with hor two, two women horses and a road trip across the u.s oh cool and uh yes i have a patreon but i have been so guilty of not doing enough with it and yet some people have been very nice uh, about it. Yet, what I am doing at this point is asking people for tips. And we keep a tip jar at PayPal me 
as opposed to PayPal. It's PayPal, uh, paypal.com slash PayPal me slash our wolf, H O U R W O L F. And even though I'm now on at 9 p.m. instead of 5 a.m., keeping the name Hour of the Wolf because it's branded, damn it. <laughs> and it's always the Hour of the Wolf somewhere. Yes. So, Uncanny Times, the official publication date is? It is October 18th, next Tuesday. Okay, very good. Um, or last Tuesday, depending on when you're listening to this. That's true. Yes. And and uh, uh, and there may be some date issues. I'll talk to you about that uh, when we're done recording. But uh, in the meantime, uh, thank you so much, Laura. And we have to do this more often than every eight years. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So, um, uh, good evening in Seattle. Good night in New York. And thank, uh, oh, wait, there's, uh, okay, yes. And, and, and somebody has a long, nice message. I'll put it on screen. <laughs> uh, but it's thanking us and saying uh, uh, a number of nice, spiffy things. And um, as I said, hopefully we will see you soon. Yep. And Laura, while we're going to sign off, uh, don't go away. <laughs> okay. Take care. Have a good night. <laughs>